Well, hello, and uh, a warm welcome to all of you joining us for our service of worship on this day. Today we are going to be looking at the question that Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And it's probably the most singular, single most important question we will ever have to answer. But before we come to that, let us begin by stilling our hearts, quietening our minds as we come and open our time together with a prayer. God of glory, the end of our searching, help us to lay aside all that prevents us from seeking your kingdom and to give all that we have to gain the pearl beyond all price through Jesus our Saviour. Amen. I'm going to ask Kate to lead us in our first song, Praise is Rising. And our first reading from Paul's letter to the Romans is going to be brought to us by Lisa. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it even without thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Radically recognise what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, 
always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. In this way, we are like the various parts of the human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way round. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. <clears throat> Each of us finds our meaning and function as part of his body. But as chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvellously functioning parts in Christ's body. Let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be, without endlessly or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other, or trying to be something we aren't. If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. I'm going to pass over to Stefan, who's going to lead us with our children's song. Are we ready? Have we got those muscles pumped and ready to go? This is Whoopa Wahey. I'm going to ask Andy if he would bring us our Gospel reading for today. This reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel. It's Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you, Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he orders his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Loving Heavenly Father, as we come to consider your word, Lord, I pray that you will give us ears to hear, that you would give us minds to understand, you would give us hearts that receive, and you would give us lives are willing to be transformed by your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said in the introduction, today we are looking at the question that Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? It's the most important question anyone has to answer in the course of their lifetime. The response will determine a person's eternal destiny. In the short term, it helps define and shape our understanding of church. The passage that was read is one of the most discussed passages in the New Testament. It is utterly foundational to our faith. And if we don't grasp and understand the ramifications of this discourse between Jesus and the disciples, it will skew our whole understanding of who Jesus is, who we are founded upon, and our godly mission. So this morning, if you come with me, we're going to look at three of the aspects, three of the things that come out of this passage. Who is Jesus? Jesus' response, and the keys. So let's start with, who do you say that I am? I find it utterly fascinating that when Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? The disciples all responded that the people thought Jesus were people, was a person who was dead and has been resurrected. They started off by saying, well, some think you're John the Baptist. Certainly Herod thought Jesus was John the Baptist. Others believed he was Elijah. Others believed he was Jeremiah. Others thought he was some other prophet. And if Jesus was indeed one of them, he would have been resurrected back to life. And the people seem to be quite happy to believe that. The irony is, of course, is that when Jesus was resurrected on that third day, no one believed him. No one believed that it had happened. But to look at the question as to who Jesus was, I'm going to cheat slightly and just read a short quote from C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity because he puts it so succinctly and so clearly. C.S. Lewis writes, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. Some say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. And now that is the one thing that we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on the same level as the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the very devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronising nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. And I think that just about sums it up. If Jesus wasn't who he said he was, then he was a liar. 
If he was a liar, how could he be a great teacher? If he was, if he was delusional, then he was insane. Again, how could he be the son of God if he was delusional? The thing we come back to is that he was who he said he was. So how did Jesus respond to what Peter says? Because Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter replied, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded with, to him and said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. What was Jesus saying here in his response to Peter's declaration that he was the Messiah? Well, firstly, Jesus was saying that Christianity is a spirituality that is not based on learning. It's not based on understanding or teaching. Although all these things are good and play a part, but Christianity is a spirituality of revelation. You see, man did not reveal who Jesus was to Peter. It was God himself from heaven. It was revelation. You see, we can learn from others about God, but we can only relate to God by spending time with him and by him revealing himself to us personally. You see, we cannot have a second-hand experience of God. We cannot know him through our parents or through our friends or, and I'll whisper it carefully, you cannot even get to know God through your priest. Our relationship with God is ours. It's no one else's. It's not shared. It's personal and individual and unique. The qualification for entering the kingdom and eternal life is not who we knew on earth. It's who we know in heaven. Secondly, Jesus then says something about building the church. And this is where often misunderstanding comes, primarily because Jesus made the simple mistake of ignoring the language in which the New Testament is written. That is Greek. If we read verses 18 and 19 lazily, we come to the conclusion that the church is built upon Peter. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, I do not wish to belong to a church, either the great universal church or our local church here in Seaford that is built upon a frail, weak, fallible, fragile human being, as Peter was. So what was it that Jesus was saying? Well, a partial apology, because I'm going to give you another quick Greek lesson. Jesus uses different words for rock and stone in this sentence. The word used for Peter is petros, and it means stone. Literally, it means pebble or chipping, a bit like the tiny stones that we put on a person's driveway. In one sense, you could even say um, it's a bit like a chip off the old block, something small. However, the rock that Jesus says he builds the church upon is not Petros, a stone, but Petra, a rock. And we're talking about a massive rock. When you think about this rock, think more like Rock of Gibraltar. And that's what we're talking about. Not Petros, stone, but rock, massive rock. The pebble refers to Peter. The rock refers to Jesus himself. Let me ask you, what kind of foundation do you want for the church? Pebble? Stone? Or a rock? How do we know that Peter isn't the rock here? Well, 
we only have to look and compare scriptures from other parts of the Bible. We look into Deuteronomy and we find it written in Deuteronomy 32, he is the rock, his works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. The rock here is referring to the one who is perfect, that is God. Paul writes to the Ephesians and he says that the church, this company of people who gather together for worship, is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. But with Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, there is the foundation of Christ and then the pebbles, the stones are put on top of it to build the church. Paul also writes to the Corinthians, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And how about Peter? How did he see all this later in life? Well, if we read in his letter to the church, in uh, 1 Peter, he's quoting from Isaiah initially, and he says, for in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a choice a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. He goes on, and he quotes from Psalm 118. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And he closes by speaking from Isaiah once again. A stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Are we seriously suggesting that Peter was suggesting that he was being spoken about in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, in the book of Psalms? No. Here, even Peter is distancing himself from this notion and making it clear that it's not him that the church is built upon. The church has Jesus as his foundation. How about then the keys to the kingdom? What are these keys that were then given to the disciples and us through Peter? This phrase, the keys of the kingdom, only appears once in scripture, here. Elsewhere in the New Testament, a key always implies authority to open a door and to give entrance to a place or a realm. For example, earlier on, in Luke 11, Jesus rebukes the lawyers, suppressing the knowledge of the kingdom in scripture and therefore preventing people from entering the kingdom. He says to them, woe to you experts in the law because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered and you have hindered those who were entering. The keys that Jesus mentions here the keys that were symbolically given to Peter were first used at Pentecost. If you think of the first two chapters of Acts where Peter is given this most incredible sermon, where he challenges the Jews and tells them that what is happening is that the Spirit is being poured out. It's being poured out on everyone just as it was prophesied. And this has happened as a result of them killing the Messiah. And at the end of that incredible sermon, can you remember what the question was that was asked as Peter closed? If not, this is what Acts chapter 2, 37 says. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Now this was the first time this question had been asked in New Testament times. I can imagine Peter stopping in his tracks. He probably didn't expect this repentant response. He was standing up there, ready for a debate, ready for an argument. But they, the question that comes back is, what should we do now? And as he pondered, as he thought for a moment, I can imagine a very clear, a very insistent, but a very familiar voice speaking revelation into his ear, saying, the 
keys, Peter. Peter, the keys. The penny dropped. And so Peter replied, Repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The keys, repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Ghost. This is the way into the kingdom. And Jesus goes on and he speaks of this kingdom. He speaks of this church against which the gates of Hades will not prevail. And spiritual warfare is part of who we are and we are on the victor's side. But let me ask you a question before you get too concerned about spiritual warfare and the gates of Hades and so on. Gates are hung on hinges. That only function is to open or close. They can go nowhere. Have you ever seen gates prevail against anything? Just imagine a moment for me. The church being chased down the road by a set of gates. It's preposterous. If anything, the church will follow in the footsteps and the example of Jesus as Jesus went down into Sheol and led captivity captive and led all the saints that had been awaiting the redemption of God, he led them to glory. We, the church, will also plunder Hades, saving those held captive by the lies and the deceit of our enemy, releasing them into the joy of a relationship with King Jesus. In essence, that's what the Great Commission, go into all the world, is all about. And so as we close, let's hold on to four simple things. Let us know who Jesus is for ourselves. Not a good moral teacher or a wise man or a mere prophet. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Secondly, the church is built upon him. His character, his authority, his divinity. And the church is built and founded on none other. Thirdly, the keys to the kingdom. They are as available to us as they were to Peter and the disciples. Repent, be baptised, receive the Holy Spirit. That's the way into this glorious kingdom with Jesus as its foundation and at its head. And lastly, the church will overcome in the power and the authority of Jesus the church will overcome the gates of Hades, not the other way around. Amen. I'm going to ask Kate if she would lead us in the song, Build My Life, which will then lead into the intercessions led by Diana.
Let us pray. Everlasting God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for revealing him as Messiah and Saviour of the world. Thank you that your Son gave St Peter the keys to the kingdom as a reward for his lively and outspoken faith, and so became the bedrock foundation of your Church here on earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we pray for your church and ask that it might always provide a solid foundation upon which we can anchor our lives. We especially pray for Christians who pay a heavy price for their faith, who daily experience hostility from their governments, employers and neighbours as a result of their identification with Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, you created us to be stewards of your creation, but we have chopped down forests, polluted the air, poisoned the rivers and seas, destroyed the places where animals live, and then pursued them to extinction. Help us to change our ways so that we can look after the world and make it the way that you want it to be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for those facing greater loss because of the COVID pandemic, that just measures will ease their burden. We pray for those whose mental health is at breaking point, that they will reach out for help and will receive help. We pray for all students as they determine the way forward in their continuing education. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for the ill, the lonely and distressed. We pray for healing and wholeness in their lives and we pray for ourselves. Help us to bring life and love joy and hope to those who live in despair and give help to all those treating the effects of COVID-19 and those working to find a cure. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, remember the souls of your servants who have departed this life and for those who are saddened by their passing. Be with the bereaved in their loneliness and give them the faith to look beyond their present troubles to your Son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again and who lives forevermore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, forgive us when we only turn to you when things trouble us and when we forget to thank you for your blessings and bounty. Help us to recognise all the wonderful things in your world for which we should be grateful. Send us out into the coming week as members of one body, ready to use the different gifts that you have given to us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so let us take all those intercessions, all those concerns of our hearts and lift them before God as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we start to close our time together, I'm going to ask John if he would lead us on the organ, singing, O Church, Arise. <laughs> that God 
and may God, who in Christ gives us a spring of water welling up to eternal life, perfect you in the image of his glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Be at peace as you love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.